Hi! Welcome to Module 2, Video 7. In this video, we're going to be talking about histograms for grouped data. In the previous video, we talked about histograms for data that was not grouped, so more discrete kind of data. In this video, we're going to make histograms for data that are grouped, so where our categories are intervals of numbers. Now, in order to make a histogram, we do need to be able to make a frequency distribution. So you may wish to review Video 2 of this module, Frequency Distributions for Groups Data, before you continue with this video. Recall that a histogram is a bar graph in which no space is given between bars. So our histogram for groups data is going to be pretty much just the same as our histogram for ungrouped data. It's the same big idea. But there are one or two small adjustments we need to make since our classes are categories instead of individual numbers. Let's investigate the steps for creating a grouped histogram. The first three steps for making a histogram for group data are exactly the same as a histogram for ungrouped data. So number one, we need to make sure we have a frequency distribution. Number two, we need to make sure we've got an appropriate scale for the vertical axis and label it accordingly. And number three, we need to determine whether or not a break is appropriate in the horizontal axis. Remember that we're going to need a break if our first value for a horizontal axis is nowhere near zero. Step four is where things are going to change just a little bit. Now, when we were making a histogram for ungrouped data, our next step was to determine an appropriate scale for the horizontal axis based on our classes. In that case, our classes were just individual numbers, so we just had easy numbers to go by. This time, however, our classes are categories. They're going to be intervals. So they're going to have a lower limit and an upper limit, and we need to decide which value should we be using. So here's our answer. We're going to use just the lower limits of the classes to determine an appropriate horizontal axis, and then we're going to label it like before. So just like before, we're going to have to make sure we go one space further as if we were going to start a new category. This is going to give us a place for our last bar to end. Now, the reason that we're using the lower limits, recall way back in video two, when we made a frequency distribution, we thought of each interval, each class, as going from lower limit, not to the upper limit, but to the next lower limit. So when we make our histogram, we want to keep that idea of each bar representing from lower limit to the next lower limit. This is why we're just using the lower limits when we label our horizontal axis. Step five is also a little bit different than it was before. In the ungrouped histogram, when we created our bars, we made sure that they were centered on each of the values so that the label was in the middle of the bar. This time, however, we really want to visualize moving from lower limit to lower limit. So the bars are also going to move from lower limit to lower limit. So what this means is the left-hand side of the bar is going to be on the lower limit of the class it represents, and the right-hand side of the bar is going to be on the next lower limit. As before, we want to make sure that there are no spaces in between our bars to really kind of give it this continuous feel. Lastly, step six is the same as it was before. We want to make sure our graph has a title so we know what information we're looking at, and we want to make sure that our vertical and horizontal axes are labeled appropriately with the correct units. Now that we know what steps to climb, let's make a histogram for groups data. In this example, our dear friend and colleague Helen has made a frequency distribution that has 10 classes for the founding years of SUNY Community Colleges. Now, we looked at this data back in video two of this module, but our frequency distribution that we made at that time only had six classes. So Helen's frequency distribution is a little bit different from the one that we made before. So we're going to use Helen's frequency distribution to make a histogram, and then we'll identify the shape of the histogram as well. Let's move all the stuff out of the way so we have room to graph. All right, so let's work our way through the six steps of making a histogram. Step one is to make sure that we have a frequency distribution. And thanks to Helen, we already have our frequency distribution made. So this is nice. We don't have to look at the raw data for this. Step one is done for us. Step two is to identify a scale for a vertical axis. Remember that in order to identify an appropriate scale, we need to look at the frequency column of our frequency distribution and identify the largest value. In this case, the largest frequency in our table is a seven. So we have to make sure our vertical axis 
includes at least all the way up to seven. It could go further than seven, but we have to make sure at least seven is included. Also remember that we want to include as much of the graph as possible. In this case, I believe if we count each line as one, we can make it up to seven. But I'm only going to label by twos. Step three is still the same as before. We need to identify whether or not we have to insert a break. If we don't have to insert a break, then I would just have a straight line there. If I do need a break, remember, it looks like a little heartbeat monitor. To see if we need a break or not, let's look at our first lower limit, 1942, which is really the number 1,942, right? That is nowhere near zero. So yeah, we definitely need a break on this one. Step four is where things are going to become a little bit different. For step four, we have to identify an appropriate scale for our horizontal axis and label it appropriately. To identify that scale, we're going to look at our first lower limit, which is still 1942. And you have a choice here. You can either choose to place the 1942 on the first line right after our break, or you can skip a space and put it on the next line. It really doesn't matter in this case. I'm going to choose to start at the one right after the break, and that's where I'll put my 1942. Now you'll recall in step four, we're only using lower limits. So to help me out, I might take a piece of paper, or in this case, some red ink, and scribble out the upper limits. We don't need them. I don't need that distraction in my life for right now. Just let's ignore it. So we're only going to be using lower limits. In this case, I have enough space for each of my bars of my histogram to be two squares wide. So I'm going to take the next lower limit of 1945, and to label it, I'm going to skip a line and then write my 1945. And I'm just going to continue to label in this manner. So the next lower limit was 1948. So I'm going to skip a line and then I'm going to mark 1948. And we'll just carry on in this manner. Now you'll notice when I made my horizontal axis, I remembered to go one space further. I could do this by adding a class width, and it looks like all of my lower limits are three apart. So if I did 1969 plus three, I could get that 1972, or I would sneak a little peek at my last upper limit, which was 1971, add one to that to get my next lower limit of 1972. All right, and step four is all done. Now for step five. Step five is where we get to draw the bars of our histogram. To draw the bars, we're going to start with the left-hand side at the lower limit, and then we're going to draw it across and down so that the right-hand side of the bar is at the next lower limit. So for our first bar of our histogram, we're beginning at 1942, and it has a frequency of one. So I'm gonna to go to 1942 on my axis, and I'm gonna draw a line up to one. Then I'm going to draw the bar across to the next lower limit. The next lower limit is 1945, so the bar is going to go across to 1945, and then it's going to come down. And that's how we'll draw each of the bars. So our next bar starts at 1945, and it has a frequency of 4. So I'm going to go up on 1945 and draw the line all the way up to 4. And then I go across to the next lower limit of 1948 and then draw the line down. And we're going to continue to draw the bars in this manner. So if you'd like to pause the video here and complete your histogram, you can do so. And then you can unpause the video and we'll check back in. All right, hopefully you've made your histogram. Let's see where the rest of the bars should go. there we go. And once again, you can see that we need that one extra space on our horizontal axis, this time so that the very last bar has a place to end. If that 1972 wasn't there, there'd be nowhere for that last bar to end. And then let's not forget step six, which is to make sure our graph has an appropriate title and that the axes are labeled. So these were the founding years of SUNY Community Colleges. So I titled my graph when SUNY Community Colleges were founded. I labeled the vertical axis frequency because these were frequencies and the horizontal axis I labeled with year since these were the years in which the colleges were founded. Now, if you wanted to, you could also shade in the bars 
or add labels to the tops of them, but that again is optional. So you can choose to do that or not. I'm going to leave my histogram the way that it is. Now recall in this example we were also instructed to identify the shape of this data. So what's the shape of the data? Recall that we talked about several different shapes. We had approximately symmetric, skewed left, skewed right, bimodal, and uniform. Now this distribution I find a little bit interesting because I don't think that the shape is immediately obvious. I don't think it jumps out right away. And here's why. One way to think about the data is to look at that 1954 to 1957 spot, and you can think of it being broken up into two distinct clumps, two groups. We have a group on the left, and we have a group on the right. And when we talked about our shapes of data, we said if the data fall into two distinct groups, then the shape of the data is going to be bimodal. However, I really don't like calling this graph bimodal because the group on the left doesn't really seem to be kind of like a group. It seems more like shorter bars with one anomaly, one taller bar. And the 1954 to 1957 doesn't have to be kind of a separation, doesn't have to be a break between the two sides. It could just be thought of as a, a shorter bar on the left-hand side. So, here's another way that we can think about this graph. Instead of seeing 1954 to 1957 as the break, I could look at the class from 1960 to 1963, and I could identify the bars to the left and the bars to the right. Remember that the bars to the left and the bars to the right are identified as tails. In this graph, the tail on the left-hand side is longer, it's more drawn out, than the tail on the right. So since the tail on the left is longer, we can identify the shape of this distribution as skewed left. So, what is the shape? Is it bimodal or is it skewed left? Recall way back in video two of this module when we talked about the shapes of data. We made a note that the number of classes that you use can significantly alter the shape of a distribution. So what I think is happening here is that Helen has very kindly made a frequency distribution for us, and it had 10 classes. But this might not be the best way to organize this data because the shape isn't coming across clearly. So let's look at the frequency distribution that we made for this data when we only use six classes, and we'll see if a shape jumps out a little bit more clearly there. So here's the frequency distribution that we made for the same data, just grouped in six classes instead of into 10. Now, if you want some more practice with making a histogram, I recommend that you pause the video here and make the histogram for this frequency distribution on your own, and you can unpause and I'll reveal what it should look like. All right, so here's the histogram for our frequency distribution. In this case, it is much easier to see the shape because we have that really tall bar from 1960 to 1965, and then we have a long tail on the left and just one bar on the right, so just one tail on the right-hand side. So very clearly, a shape of being skewed left is jumping out at us. So this means that our data are skewed left. So if you're making a histogram to display data and the shape is not easily identifiable, play around with your class width a little bit or play around with the number of classes that you're using and hopefully some other shapes will kind of jump out at you. So this is also a little bit of a warning because if you don't use enough classes, what ends up happening is you just end up with a couple of bars, so there's no real shape to the graph. But if you use too many classes, then the data becomes much more spread out and you'll find more clumps like we did with Helen's frequency distribution. So that's what we meant when we talked about needing to kind of find the right balance with the number of classes and with your class width. Now, a quick note, when we made our frequency distribution, we also followed up by making a relative frequency distribution. And you could use either a frequency distribution or a relative frequency distribution to create a histogram. The only thing that's going to be different for our histogram is that vertical axis. Instead of being the amount, it's going to be a relative frequency. So let's look at an example of a relative frequency histogram and see if we can use it to answer some questions. In this example, we're going to look at a relative frequency distribution for data that was found at the Quantitative Environmental Learning Project. This particular website has lots of data about different aspects of environmental science. 
So if you're interested in that, it's a pretty cool site to check out. In this case, the Rothamsted Experimental Station in Great Britain began a series of long-term studies all the way back in 1843 to measure the effect of inorganic and organic fertilizers on how many crops they get. So this histogram is showing us the relative frequency of the bushels per unit plot from 1910. Let's use this histogram to answer a few questions. What is the shape of this distribution? So the shape of this distribution is pretty easy to spot. We have one tall bar in the center, and then it gradually gets shorter as I move down to either side. And the tail on the left and the tail on the right are about the same length. So this distribution is approximately symmetric. Question B. What's the class width? Now when we had a frequency distribution, or a relative frequency distribution, we can find the class width by subtracting the first two lower limits. When we make a histogram, we only use the lower limits. So to find the class width, just subtract any two consecutive values on the horizontal axis. For example, my first two lower limits are 2.5 and, and 2.75. So I can subtract the two and get 0.25 bushels per unit plot. Make sure to label your answer before you box it in. All right, and our last question, question C. What percent of plots yielded between three and a half and four and a half bushels per unit plot? This question is really kind of two parts. First, we need to make sure we're looking at the bars that pertain to plots between three and a half and four and a half bushels per unit. Then we have to identify the relative frequencies and convert those into a percentage. So in this case, I'm going to find 3.5 and 4.5 on my axis, and I want to look at just the bars in between those two marks. So these are the bars that represent the plots that we're interested in. To find what percent of the plots these represent, just add together the relative frequencies. So I'm going to add together 0 0.172, 0 0.202, 0 0.188, and 0.152, and that will give us 0.714. Since we were asked what percent of plots, we need to convert this ratio into a percentage. We can do that by multiplying by 100 or moving the decimal point to the right two spots. Either way, our answer ends up being 71.4%. As a quick check for reasonableness, if I look at the bars that are in that red outlined region, does that look like 71%? Does that look like about three-fourths of the graph as a whole? And I think it does, because that's where our tallest bars are, even though it's a little narrow, it's where the tallest bars are. And if you look at the edges, that probably looks like 25% of the data, and then the chunk in the middle is about 3 quarters. Again, just a quick reasonableness kind of check. This concludes our video for histograms for groups data. If you would like to see our video about histograms for ungrouped data, you can click on the arrow to the left. In our next video, we're going to be talking about making stem and leaf plots. Just like a dot plot was a quick way to make a graph similar to a bar graph, but much, much more quickly, a stem and leaf plot is a quick way to make a graph similar to a histogram, but much, much more quickly. Stem and leaf plots are also a great way to organize your data from lowest to highest in a fairly quick manner. So if you'd like to watch the video on that, you can click the arrow to the right. As always, thanks for watching and have a fantastic day.